Okay. Now I'm going to hand over to Malika and Nilufar. Hi everyone, let me start sharing my screen with you. Thank you for joining today. Um, okay. Um, I'm Malika and my co-presenter Nilufar. Um, Hi everyone, I'm Nilufar. I'm um, as um, you may already know, I'm a financial analyst. And today me and Melika are gonna talk about the future. So let's start with what happened this year. This year has been a weird year for the world. COVID-19 was not the only surprising thing that happened this year, but for sure it was the share pain around the world. It brought us too many shared experiences regardless of race, nationality, and socioeconomics. Not in indicating everyone went through the same thing, but there was a lot of similar experience Experiences. For example, staying at home, working from home, and so on. Since January, there had been hundreds of articles and discussions on the life after the pandemic. What's going to happen? How will we live? How will we work? How should we shift our business to accommodate for the changes? How long the lifestyle will last? And today, me and Melika are going to tr uh, try to uh, answer to put these questions from two different perspectives perspective of finance and perspective of design. So what's next? Are we gonna work from home forever? You know, small businesses survive. Will we ever go to a concert again? How will this catalyze the next industrial revolution? This is a really important question, especially when it comes to uh, innovators and entrepreneurs. Um, so today we talk about two different approaches to foresight the future. We can either predict it uh, which is mostly what financial analysts and financial forecasters are do because we don't really have um, any control over the market. We can only predict and we can only strategize how we're going to react to those predictions. But uh, when it comes to design, you have a little say in how the future is going to evolve. So you can plan for the future. And that's where Malika um, concentrates on. She's going to take over now. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so as Nelkar mentioned, we have two different approaches, but both of our, us are doing analysis. I do uh, qualitative analysis and she does quantitative analysis to create future-proof strategies for different industries. But before I start, I just want to uh, kind of define what, what future-proof means, because whenever we talk about future, mostly people refer to futuristic ideas. Uh, which are basically anything that can happen in the future versus future proof uh, ideas are the things that can sustain in the future. I give you an example to make it more clear. Let's say that we are trying to tackle the problem of traffic uh, in big cities in rush hours, right? So a futuristic idea would be basically what we have been seeing in science fiction uh, movies and books, air trains, multiple layers of transportation, uh, a flying car, all these type of crazy ideas. But a future-proof strategy would be something like um, interzone project. Uh, basically, this project was trying to split the workforce in three main groups in big cities um, by having some overlap between different uh, workforce, but a different starting and ending point of the working hours. For example, group A would start work at 8 a.m., group B would start work at 11 a.m., and group C would start at 2 p.m. And that would reduce down the traffic in city by one third, right? So that's a future-proof type of a strategy. And I'm gonna start with the design approach to it and uh, how I've been working with my teams in different um, companies uh, to tackle this. But before that, I want to take a moment and define design because as a designer, if uh, we have designers on the um, chat, we, we share the same experience. So whenever you introduce yourself as designer, people always think that you are only tweaking colors, fonts, or um, doing furniture setting for uh, a new house. But design is way more than that. Basically, it's an overlap of strategy, future studies, art and technology. The process um, is the design process. It could be in different industries for different purposes. But what I'm gonna double down now is the future studies, uh, obviously, because of the topic of the talk. And uh, I'm gonna show you a graph that Elliot Montgomery um, 
created for future studies uh, in general, what are the disciplines in it? Uh, the spectrum that you see starts from unconstrained future to constrained futures. Unconstrained would be some uh, more uh, towards the art direction, uh, such as science fiction movies uh, that trying to depict um, uh, apocalypse or an utopia. Uh, and uh, constraints uh, type of a strategy, uh, type of um, futuring would be more aligned to the two strategies. And we are familiar with certain topics such as design thinking, if you work in business and design or design futures. So I'm going to talk about this strategy piece in futuring today and to develop the, the, the framework that I have developed, uh, not all pieces is mine, but just I have put together and work with different groups. Uh, and uh, it's a generic future strategy framework, but what it does basically, it tries to speculate new uh, near future problems or opportunities from different angles by looking at uh, what's happening right now and to ideate uh, new products or services responding to, to those future scenarios. Basically, what we are trying to do uh, through this framework is to define the most desirable future for us and, avoid, uh, and uh, plan for avoiding the least desirable one. It has five different uh, steps. The first three would start uh, uh, with questioning why we should do something. And the last two would focus on what we should do. First step, sensing. What is sensing uh, and what does it mean here? It's very simple. It's basically staying on top of any trend or news or signal that's happening. And uh, the important thing here is to not just look at what's happening in your own industry, but to broaden your perspective and try to look from different lenses. For example, if you're in tech, you should uh, watch out for political events, uh, econo economical, social, uh, social and ecological um, trends and signals that are happening. And I mentioned trends and signals, but let me define what they mean. Trend is a general direction in which something is developing or changing. For example, take uh, online schooling. Because of the pandemic, it became a thing around the world, different capacities, but it's something that uh, has been going on in the past few months. And uh, we can say that some aspect of it will stay with us for the future. And a signal would be an indication of a thing. It could be a, a, a change. It could be an event. It could be a new product. It could be um, a piece of political news that will bring, we foresee it would bring some changes. For example, um, um, an uh, example of a uh, signal would be the release of the um, uh, iPhone SE, which is a ch comparatively cheaper iPhone. What uh, that would indicate that, okay, technology, uh, technical uh, hardware te uh, technology is becoming a bit more um, affordable and uh, following that Google released the cheaper uh, Pixel phone. So that's a signal. And what do we do, like, how do we stay on top of these things and um, browse trends and signals? It's very simple. Um, just basically make sure that your team, your um, company has a monthly, bi-monthly um, meetings that everybody brings different news, uh, different things that they have observed and read and uh, share it with each other. And it's not a bad idea to invest uh, in purchasing some trends library for your company if you can afford it. They always like uh, kind of help you to have a uh, basically more holistic perspective on what's happening um, and not to miss something that is not in your radar. Next step is speculating. Uh, speculating, I mean, the name is basically imagining. Um, you, it's the process of a storytelling of the future. In this uh, phase, you try to just um, mix the signals and trends that you have observed and try to imagine the future. You can go crazy with it. Uh, this is the framework that I use always in my workshop, but uh, you can be creative with it. And um, anything that um, it sounds crazy or feasible is welcomed here. You don't judge any idea at this phase. I give you some example to make it a bit more uh, tangible. Um, I just mentioned there is a uh, lower price iPhone and 
uh, a trend in on online schooling. So in the future, we can say teenagers will own more iPhones to do their school tasks. That's a, a probable future maybe. Or because of the several years of campfires in California and the new forever work from home announcement from uh, Twitter and other companies, in the future, more tech experts will move out of the Bay Area to live in healthier and more convenient con uh, condition. That could be a scenario. Or you can go a bit more crazy. For example, before, because of aging population of the world and the high adoption rate of voice assistant in US, in the future, US senior citizens will expect to have a voice AI to talk to when they feel lonely. Uh, no judgment here, right? So we welcome everything. And then in the next step, which is filtering, we try to choose the ones that make sense for us to work on. For that, we used uh, FutureCon. It's a, a framework has, uh, that was adopted by Fors Foresight Strategies for years now. So I'm gonna quickly go over it uh, and explain. So as you see in this chart, future is not linear, right? Uh, the timeline is not linear. You start from the present time and it could go in different paths. So that's why it, uh, it looks like a, sh a cone. And uh, they have divided this path to probable, plausible, and possible. Anything that can come to your mind is possible. But things that are more likely to happen, but uh, stars have to uh, align, are plausible. It's not for sure. And uh, the ideas that you have that are basically things that are very obvious to you that are going to happen uh, would belong to the probable category. So now you choose the timeline that you want to focus on. Let's say you want to work on, on your strategy three years to six years from now and try to plot all the scenarios that you came up with in a speculating phase on this call. For example, these black dots are my scenarios. And uh, I know my timeline is two years to six years from now on. So I would only consider the scenarios that fall under plausible uh, and pro probable in that timeline. Uh, for example, let's plot the previous scenarios. The um, uh, higher adoption of iPhone by teenagers would probably fall uh, on probable. The um, uh, senior citizen wanting to talk to an AI would probably be impossible. It's not plausible in near future. And um, tech experts moving out of the Bay Area might be implausible uh, section of the future con. This is my personal uh, opinion. It doesn't mean it's true. You can work with your team to plot this. So I choose these two that uh, fall under the pink area and take it to the next step, which is pay dating. So you have your future scenarios. And now you want to create jobs to be done for this scenario, for your team, for your uh, company, in whatever capacity you work on. Basically, what you're doing here is like this brainstorming that we're all familiar with. You try to put the scenario in front of you and try to assess if it will bring you an opportunity for a new product or a risk for your current services. For example, let's take the um, uh, iPhone scenario. Uh, because uh, there's a rise, uh, uh, the rise in usage of iPhone in teenagers, uh, we will have an opportunity to release the iOS version of the app. So our target customer can continue using our services after transitioning. This would apply to a um, software company that only has Android version, right? But what if you are a hardware company using um, a creating phone, such as Google? That means for you that a little bit of your market share is moving away. You need to focus on the, uh, creating products and services for young adults to attract them back to your products. So that would be certain ideas. It could be even more specific. You could even uh, idea the specific products too. There is nothing, uh, no wrong idea, but uh, you wanna uh, basically filter this as well to make, uh, make sure that you pick the one that makes sense for your business. So you grab all the ideas and try to assess if uh, they are feasible, uh, if they bring business um, value, they will bring revenue for your company. And if uh, they will bring value for your current users and the target market that you are um, aiming to provide service for. 
if you check off that, then you can consider that as something on your roadmap and work towards. You put there there and you try to backcast and see how you can um, basically get to that future. But um, there's this question. We have this, we have this uh, roadmap, but are we immune uh, to the future? The uh, answer is maybe because um, you can never expect um, things that can happen. For example, none of us would um, predict a pandemic coming, right? Um, and uh, these things can happen no matter how up to the events and trends you are, and that might shift your service and offering. But what this strategy planning and exercises bring to you is basically a resiliency for your company. I give you an example. Um, two years ago, to 2018, I was working uh, at Samsung and we were doing this exercise, monthly exercise. <clears throat> and we had some ideas around, um, they were more like crazy ideas back then that, okay, what if we create a workstation for people who always work from home? Or what if we create um, certain home workout um, services uh, for people so they can work out from home? At uh, that time, they, that these ideas were because of um, the trends and signals that were happening, but didn't seem to be the mainstream ideas because none of us knew that COVID-19 is gonna happen. But when COVID-19, uh, the pandemic hit, what, what you do is basically you grab whatever uh, you have and try to um, build off of that. So having those on the radar and having MVP products or MVP ideas for these things make, it re uh, make you resilient, your team, your company resilient for adopting fast and changing uh, your focus and shifting your uh, path uh, for the future. Is there any question about this framework or this process? Um, there's a question from Kanika. Um, are there any books, articles you read that influence this framework? Uh, many. Um, so as mentioned, Elian Montgomery has a book. Uh, you can Google that. Um, Scott Smith uh, has a uh, book as well um, about future. And I don't remember the title. Um, there are, this, this is a discipline. Uh, I have uh, studied many papers. I cannot remember any uh, article right now, but if you um, start from these two, I think you would get a good idea from um, how these things work. Thank you. I can type into the chat as well. Anything else? Uh, Okay, if not, we can move on to the next um, approach, which is data approach. Nilifar, please. Thank you, and hello again. So, um, as Malika mentioned, her part was more design approach, and I focus more on data approach, specifically in finance. So, there are generally two methods that you can use to forecast in finance. One is the traditional method of using financial data. You look at um, stock market returns, you look at central bank rates, and you look at macroeconomic data, and you use um, simple mathematical models like regression. If you want to be fancier, you can use machine learning techniques to forecast the future. But uh, nowadays we are being bombarded by information, so why not make use of them? Uh, financial analysts nowadays tend to use more and more non-financial data. Uh, to give you some examples, these non-financial data can be satellite data. For example, if you look at the parkings in a mall, uh, you can uh, conclude how much uh, economic activity is happening in that area. You can look at traffic data, or you can look at uh, booking.com data or open table restaurant reservation data. You can look at aggregated credit card balance. Um, the more balance people have, it means that they're spending more and earning less. So it may be a signal for the future. You can also do um, natural language processing and you can analyze the speeches or the tweets of uh, some specific um, targeted individuals or a uh, general public on um, Twitter to see whether they're um, talk more talking about positive things or negative things, or you can do the same for the uh, news analysis. 
all these would give you an alternative source of data that you can use to you um, to forecast for the future. But let's see how we can start doing that. So in order to foresight, obviously you'll start with looking back. You look back your historical data and uh, you try to pick up trends. And then you look at what's happening right now. And then you build the model uh, based on what's happening right now. But what's happening right now is actually not so easy to find out. Um, you may know on a small scale what's happening in your area, in your neighborhood, when talking about economic activity. But then on a broader sense, when you go to a larger scale, it's really difficult. So that's a question that um, makes our uh, problem more difficult to solve. So not only we need to be able to forecast the future, we need to now cast what's happening right now as well. And it's a tricky thing to do because, um, go to the next slide please. Thank you. So there are a few problems with now casting. One is that data are released with a delay. For example, the GDP data or PMI data, they are um, released by a three month and a one month uh, delay. So you would never know what's, what is the GDP right now because when uh, what's happening now will have a uh, effect on the report that's gonna come out in three months. Um, they also may not have the frequency that you desire. You may want to be able to rebalance your financial portfolio every week, but then you have a signal that is released every month. Then you go ahead and release, uh, uh, rely on surveys that you get from people. For example, PMI is Purchasing Managers Index, which is basically based on surveys. But then you can't really rely on those either because people tend to rely on those um, surveys, not willingly. Um, they sometimes don't even know that they're lying. And uh, for example, take this um, case. In 2016, uh, for the US election, all the data, all the surveys were showing that Trump is, gonna, is not gonna get elected and he's gonna lose. Um, that was mainly because there were tons of undecided people who when uh, they were asked on the surveys, who are you gonna vote for? They would say Hillary, not because they knew they're gonna vote for Hillary. It was more like peer pressure because it was cooler to say that you're voting for Hillary. But then when actually the day came, they went ahead and voted for Trump. So they didn't even know that they're lying. Or another example could be when you ask people, uh, why do you buy luxury bags? Um, they probably will start lecturing you about how durable it is, how, how of a good quality it is, or um, they would talk about how trendy it is and how they're invested in fashion and they're willing to spend money on fashion. But the truth is um, they buy luxury brands because uh, they want to belong to a specific um, status. They want to belong to a specific class. So their status signaling, and um, but they don't know that. So you really cannot rely on surveys um, anymore. Also, when it comes to quantitative analysis, it gets even trickier. Let's go to the next slide. Um, take this question. So you have two totally uh, random variable sets and you are asked to calculate the correlation. Which of the following result is a possible outcome in your opinion? Um, those two different sets are totally unrelated. They come from different sources. Um, and then you calculate the correlation. Do you think it's gonna be closer to zero, um, closer to 0.5 or more? What do you think? You can um, send the answers in 0.5. I got a 0.5. Yep, let me know what you think. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so most people would think that it wouldn't, it can't go above 0.5. I get a 0 0.5, 0 0.1, and 0 0.3. Um, some people would even say zero because they're totally unrelated, right? The correct answer is it could be anything. So especially when you have a small um, set of data. Let's go to the next slide. So when two things are related, um, their correlation is close to one. But if their correlation is close to one, it doesn't mean that they're related. Take these few examples. Um, so the graph on the left shows the number of people who drowned in a pool and uh, 
Also, on the same graph, you see that the films that Nic Nicolas Cage appeared in, and you can see that they are really closely um, correlated. To the right, you see the age of Miss America versus murders by steam, hot makers, and hot objects. You can again see that they're almost perfectly correlated, really close to one, but um, we all know they're not related. So this is a problem that um, sometimes can cause us, can make us make uh, conclusions that, you know, don't make sense or are not true. And this happens just randomly and mostly because you have a small set of data. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, so the question is how to write a paper in medicine. You can't really trust the results that you get um, in medical papers. Why? Because their, their sample size is very small. Um, there are different reasons for that. One is that not a lot of people have the exact same condition. And also a lot of patients are not willing to share their information with you or participate in your experiment. So basically what you need to do is to try the experiment with different samples, with different combinations of different samples until you get the results that you want, which is usually getting a correlation and getting a good p-value that eventually would um, help you get a grant. So most of the papers that are written in uh, empirical sciences, especially medicine, are not reliable. The other problem that uh, we should be aware of is the turkey problem. So imagine you're a turkey and you're living happily on a farm. You have a human that feeds you every day. Um, he protects you from the foxes. He keeps you healthy, keeps you dry, and he's your friend, right? he probably cares about you as much as you care about yourself. But then on a, on a day, a while before the Christmas day, something really bad happens to you. So this is called the turkey problem. And if you wanna be fancier, mathematicians and philosophers call it the problem of induction, making a claim based on series of observations in the past. Even if the past is as big of your entire existence, you still cannot really rely on that. If something hasn't happened in the past, it doesn't mean that it's not going to happen in the future. So we can really forecast that well. Um, so in economics, a significant around 10% is considered really good. Uh, we just want to be a little better than a coin flip. A coin flip has a 50-50 probability of going up or down. But then in stock market, we just want to be a little bit better than that. But even that is really difficult to achieve. Um, Specifically, because there are, there are events called as black swans that are impossible to predict by definition. So black swans are events that are impossible to predict and their payoff and their effect on your payoff is usually very, very big. Uh, uh, an example could be COVID-19. Nobody see that coming, of course, except Bill Gates. I think we all know that he already knew it's coming up, but nobody could predict it. So that's a really good example of a black swan event. Um, so what are we supposed to do? We can't really predict the future. We can maybe predict it up to 10%. But even if we can do that, there are always black swans that we can never predict. So what's the solution? We should always try to be convex. And let's see that visually, what, what, it, what it means by being convex. A thing that is convex gains from uncertainty. So it likes uncertainty. Look at the graph. So on the right, you see your underlying variable. And on the left, you see your, uh, on the, I'm sorry, vertical axis, you see your gain and loss. So you see that if something very extreme to the right on the, uh, on the X axis happens, you have a gain that is more than the loss or the pain that you have to endure. And that's a convex payoff, and that's how you want it to be. So if something ex extreme happens, you're going to gain a lot. If it doesn't happen, you're going to lose, but you're going to lose a little bit. And that's how you want it to be. And in finance, it's almost not too difficult to achieve it. Let's go to the next one. Um, it brings us to the concept of anti-fragility. So something which is fragile is your cup of coffee. Um, if an earthquake happens, your cup of coffee will, um, yeah, will break. Something bad is going to happen to it. But you want to be the exact opposite of your cup of coffee. You want to be able to gain from the disorder. Um, an example could be call options in finance. Um, you can see the payoff of the call option on the left graph. 
um, you see the payoff of the stock itself, and then you see the payoff of call option. For the stock, you see that you can have a gain, but you can also have a loss that is as big as the gain. But then for the call option, your loss is bounded. So um, you can have an infinite uh, gain, but your loss is bounded. And you can see that it has this convex shape, and that's how you want it to be. So basically what you need to do is you need to design your payoff, and that payoff could be your financial payoff, could be your uh, mental health, could be your um, level of stress, could be the revenue of company. Uh, you need to have a strategy that gives you a payoff that's convex. So if some black swan event happens, it's going to gain from it, like Zoom. Um, look at the graph on the right. So you can see the comparison be between different um, types of system. A system that is fragile, it's bad. It's going to lose a lot when a black swan event happens. A resilient system, it will um, lose a little bit, but then it will go back to normal. But something that is anti-fragile, like um, Zoom, it will gain from uncertainty. So if you want to have a takeaway from tonight's talk, uh, try to be convex, try to be anti-fragile, and there are different ways to approach it. Uh, one other example that I forgot to say, maybe it's a more um, relatable example in the day-to-day -day life, is exercising. For example, um, let's assume that you lift a weight that weighs one kilogram 10 times, and then you weight um, a weight that, it, that weighs 10 kilograms just once. Which one is better for your muscle building? The latter. Even though the first one is less volatile, what helps your muscles um, get bigger and get better is the latter. So muscle building is something that gains from stress. So stress can prepare your body for even bigger stress. Uh, and it's building the extra capacity that lies at the core of why being anti-fragile is so helpful to thrive in a critical situation. Uh, yep, so basically from um, what we shared from different lenses, um, if you want to sum it up, uh, it would be three points. Uh, use current events as, and trends as a platform of discussion within uh, your teams, uh, your uh, organization to design future visions. Um, and don't think that you can control everything. Um, uh, unexpected things can happen, but when uh, you can have a strategy, you can uh, respond to it faster. Uh, so the, the future proof strategy that we mentioned earlier. If something has not happened in the past, uh, it doesn't mean that it's not going to happen again in the future. So don't only rely on the knowledge uh, of the, uh, the industry or your or past uh, experience. Try to be prepared for uh, extreme situations and create uh, strategies that are flexible uh, for those type of situations. With that, thank you for listening to us. Um, now we take questions from both topics. Uh, I know some people have uh, asked some question and um, we can start uh, by those and please feel free to add on. Let me scroll up the chat. Okay, Milka, I think there is a question for you and there are two for me. You can go ahead and answer the one and then I'll sure. answer it. I see the last one. How do you decide who is part of discussion to rank potential scenarios as a probable, possible, etc., for the most robust uh, conclusions? Just people within the organization or users uh, and maybe clients as well. Um, so, the, I mean, it's a really good question because the more diverse you can be in uh, bringing different backgrounds, uh, the better, uh, the more bulletproof it, it will be. Because um, that, some, especially when you're expert in uh, certain areas, you always uh, tend to s uh, see certain connections and you miss other possibilities. Because this exercise is all about exploring uh, different possibilities, it's better to have people with different uh, expertise. And if you have the luxury of bringing your users or, uh, into the discussion, that will be fabulous because uh, they are going to think differently. Uh, so the more diverse, uh, the better on that. Um, let me find this again. Where does the future looking design process fit? into the regular product idea, design, develop, 
develop process of a regular org? How do you make it part of the process? Uh, if I get it right, you're asking how this process fit into the regular product development. Um, so when you are, uh, have decided on what you're making, um, it wouldn't be as useful. Uh, um, it would be more something when you're planning your strategy, you're planning uh, the next move rather than in the midst of developing a product. So um, different um, organizations have different process for that, different check-ins for that. Some innovation centers might have it monthly, but some uh, orgs uh, maybe have it every two years. So it depends uh, on your org, but it would be the most useful before you start a product. Uh, and if you always do it as a site, uh, it will always influence your current product development for sure. But uh, as a way to plan for your <clears throat> roadmap, this would be the best to uh, do before uh, starting the product idea. If I answer your question. Hey guys, uh, follow up with your question. Please feel free to open your mic and interact with speakers directly. Okay, Nilofar, do you want to read the next one? Sure. Um, so Shishir is asking, how can you use the non-financial data to connect with finance and predictions? So basically what you want to do is you want to have a quantitative measure for your non-financial data. Um, some of them are already quantitative. For example, Google Trends. It gives you a number um, of the number of uh, words that has been uh, searched for in the past week. But sometimes it's not that easy. For example, if you're doing sentiment analysis, um, you just want to know if people are talking positively about this specific um, thing or negatively. And what you can do is to you define a, a, a ratio for that. For example, um, you count the number of positives, you count the number of negatives, and then you take the ratio. If the ratio is bigger than this threshold, then you give it a positive. The other way, you give it a negative, and then you can do a logistic regression, which is a plus and minus. You basically take every every non-financial data and make it into something uh, from something qualitative into something quantitative, and then after that, it's just a matter of selection of uh, what kind of mathematical modeling methods you can use, what kind of time split analysis you can use. You can use something as easy as um, regression and look um, more um, complex and use neural networks or other machine learning techniques. So uh, let me know if you I've answered your question. And I'm gonna go to the next one. Um, uh, Narcissa is asking, in a company's prediction analysis, how much effort should be invested in anti-fragility areas? Is there a recommended ratio from your exposures thus far? So I wanna say that it depends on your strategy and uh, how long into the future you're looking at. Also, it depends of, on your level of risk awareness because um, as you mentioned, uh, there's a lot of effort that you need to pay, um, you need to put in order to have a uh, anti-fragile strategy and it's costly. So how much do you wanna go? Um, if you have a, um, if you're applying for the next year, maybe in a period of a year, a uh, black swan event is not very probable. But if you're looking in the next 10 years, next 20 years, you're uh, designing a roadmap for a longer period of time, um, you have to pay more and more attention to these black swan events. And what is very important is that you want to be able to survive. So it doesn't matter how much money you've made in the past years, black swan events can swipe up all your earnings. So I think it comes down to a company, company specific strategy. Um, some companies tend to go more for um, instant revenues and um, you know they kind of want to push the risk into unknown um, area that they can't see but then someday those will be the companies that are going to get ruined but the companies that spend more on being anti-fragile are the companies that are going to survive so i think at the end of the day it comes down to your personal pre uh, preference if I have a company one day, I'm definitely going to spend a lot of money on anti-fragility because you want to survive. At the end, the winner is the person or the company who survives. And there is no specific ratio, recommended ratio, uh, or something that is like rule of thumb that is out there that you can use. 
It depends on the situation, depends on the timeline and the risk awareness of your own company. I think the next one is for you. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you pick the audience segment? Uh, teenagers for the future storytelling exercise, is it based on desired audience or existing target audience? Um, Menaka, uh, if you remember uh, that scenario was uh, a conclusion of two, uh, one trend and one uh, signal, the trend was online schooling, which is uh, mostly uh, adopted by teenagers or the target is for teenagers. And the signal was uh, the new iPhone, um, the new uh, low price iPhone. And uh, that scenario was the conclusion of combining these two. So the imagination went through that was, okay, uh, if uh, teenagers uh, doing online schooling, they need the devices, better devices to connect. And there is cheaper uh, technology out there. So they're, they're gonna convert uh, to those cheaper technologies from they may be low, uh, low price uh, Android phone, they can uh, maybe afford uh, the new iPhone. That's how it came through. So when you are speculating, you don't have a specific target on mind, is basically um, trying to make sense of those uh, trends and signals. Your audience comes at the end of the uh, ranking and evaluating, and uh, you're, try you're trying to basically respond to the scenarios uh, based on the perspective of your users. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Farnik. Thank you, Farnik, for joining us. So um, he's asking regarding the correlation plots, do they just say that the well-known quote, correlation doesn't mean causation, or your point has something different from it? It's exactly what you said. Correlation doesn't mean causation. But then um, when writing papers and when looking for signals, we tend to forget that uh, when we see something that's working, um, especially if that working means that we're going to get a grant or we're going to get uh, a project, um, you know, approved for implementation, we tend to forget that part. So um, basically, we should learn not to trust um, correlation when we see them. Thank you. Um, Nick, uh, would you have any examples that I can uh, dive deeper into where companies have built something great out as a spec of the futuristic design thinking? Um, something that comes to my mind is Google X Lab. Google X Lab uh, design, uh, mani uh, design lead is uh, one of the well-known uh, design speculative, uh, speculative designers. Uh, they uh, try to basically explore ideas uh, for future approval. Um, they, they build the idea, the prototype, maybe they are not ready for mass production, but they built the idea and uh, have it prepared. Um, another, um, I think most tech companies, the uh, very big ones that can afford that, uh, have some sort of innovation lab that they use that strategy. But um, I don't specifically remember the name of the labs that they have, but Google X, if you um, search it, you will see and read the page. Welcome. All right. Um, does everyone has any other questions? Or, oh, okay. We have another one. I think this one for Nilufa. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, regarding the example with the long call option, would you agree that in the end, it also depends on how many people are demanding? set call option going long, because in the end, there has to be a counterparty that sells you that option. So there must be companies, persons that want to deal with the opposite, non-convex, non-convex payoff structures. So would you say it also depends on the circumstances and the price and what you prefer? Okay, yes, exactly. If you want to buy something, there should be a seller for that. But the thing is, a lot of people, like I said, uh, they just think about a lot of people and companies, they only think about payoff right now. So if you can sell a call option to someone um, that you don't think it's going to get executed, it's a good short term revenue for your company. 
So there will always be companies who are willing to go convex, uh, take the risk um, in order to have some um, revenues at the moment. And then that's what those companies are probably gonna have a hard time if a black swan event happens. But because of, of the greed, a lot of companies would like to do that in any kind of situation. But yeah, of course, the whole uh, position uh, that you can take depends on the, um, the, what is it called? Ecosystem of the whole market, how if everybody wants to be convex, then yeah, you can't really buy that option from anyone. But that's never the case because companies get greedy and they tend to underestimate that the risks that they may um, have to endure. So I hope I answered your question. Hey, Casper and others, in case you all have any follow-up uh, for this, you can always unmute your mic and ask. Okay, um, I guess... Thank you everyone for joining us tonight and thank you so much Malika and Yonofar for this wonderful session. Um, guys, please do connect with them on LinkedIn and message them if you have you know, extra questions or you want to just connect with them. And uh, before I end this meeting tonight, um, could I just ask everyone to open your um, video cameras so we can take a um, screenshot of everyone who has joined this, today's meeting. Should I just stop sharing? Yeah. Great, great. Let me see. Hi, everyone. Hello. Okay. Are you ready for the screenshot? Three, two, one. Smile, guys. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. For everyone who joined us and please do connect with Medica and um uh, Nilfar on LinkedIn. Thank you everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye, -bye. Thanks, Malika. Thanks, Nilfar. Bye.